spirit Cohen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. I think that little prayer captures well what we're going to reflect on tonight because Pentecost is really not just a day that we celebrate, um, it's the beginning of something. Um, a wedding ceremony is a good ceremony, but basically it's the beginning of a new way of life. The birth is a great event, but it begins it's the beginning of an unfolding of a whole life. I think we could say that the incarnation of the word uh, was a great moment in history, but it was just the beginning. It was unfolding in the life of Jesus leading on to his passion and his resurrection. So when we look at Pentecost, we're not just looking at the liturgy of today, we're looking at an event that is not only central in the church, but in fact uh, is responsible for the creating of the church. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at um, some of the key figures um, who have talked about Pentecost. And then we're going to look at the spirit briefly in the life of Jesus, but particularly in the life of the church and in the life of the disciples. Because really the movement has begun is a new stage in salvation history. And in that new stage, um, the, the, um, the church and individual disciples um, have a key role. So we might begin with the, the gospel of St. Luke. And Luke's gospel is particularly uh, focused on the Holy Spirit. Luke has more about the Spirit. He has over a hundred references to the Spirit in his writings. Other writers uh, would, wouldn't even get to 20 or 30. And he talks about the role of the Spirit in the life of Jesus. Um, when um, Zachariah was told that John the Baptist was going to be born, uh, it was said he will be filled with the Spirit. Uh, the incarnation, it is the Spirit that hovers over man, ma Mary. Uh, in the baptism of Jesus, Jesus receives the Spirit. And then after that, uh, Luke says, filled with the Spirit, he is led by the Spirit into the desert. So in the life of Jesus, we see the Spirit already active. But the Spirit we're going to talk about tonight is that same Spirit, but in the period after Jesus has left. So the Feast of Pentecost is really looking ahead to that time when Jesus was not going to be present. The very context in which it takes place is the fact that Jesus is about to leave his physical presence uh, to his disciples. They are concerned and he talked to them about what is going to happen in the future. Luke doesn't say very much, but he says enough. He says that they will be given the promise from on high. And he ends the gospel with that promise, uh, with the ascension. And he begins the Acts of the Apostles with the ascension and the same message. And the message is that the Holy Spirit will come. And the Holy Spirit will be a power that will enable the disciples to proclaim the gospel and to be witnesses to Jesus. And when we look at Luke's um, presentation of Pentecost, we can see that that's exactly what happens. The spirit comes upon them and immediately they go out and they are preaching about what has taken place in the life of Jesus. They are sharing with others the mystery um, of salvation. And as the acts of the apostles unfold, uh, it's the spirit that is guiding the early disciples. Some people have suggested that probably the acts of the apostles should be called the acts of the spirit because the spirit is the one who guides that early community. So really Pentecost is about the church primarily. It is more, but at the moment, let us just focus on the church. 
I find in society today, many people are unhappy with the church. And there are two things that often come up that I think are, are worth considering in the light of the Pentecost event that we have just experienced. The first is that people often see the beginning of the church solely in historical terms. Yes, they acknowledge Jesus, but really what happened was the church was just influenced by historical events and ended up with the church that we have today. And yet clearly what we have here is that we're celebrating the birthday of the church with the coming of the spirit, that the church didn't just unfold like any historical event, it was an historical event, but it was a, an unfolding that was inspired by the spirit. And the spirit has been part of the church all the way up until our own time and will be in the future. We believe that our sources of revelation are the scriptures and our tradition. And what is our tradition? Well, the tradition is the church reflecting and dialoguing with the scripture in every age. And it does that under the inspiration of the spirit. I find today that many people say, well, let's leave that aside and get back to the scriptures. That's what matters. And yet the spirit guided history of the church does have a role. Now, when we look back, certainly we have to separate what is the work of the spirit and what is just history. But too easily people just put aside the tradition of the church when in fact it's an important source of our revelation. Another thing that the other thing that um, I find with people is that some people say to me, yes to Jesus, but no to the church. And I often say, how can we say yes to Jesus if we deny that body that he created through the spirit and is his presence into the future today? I mean, it's through the church um, that we actually receive the spirit. Uh, Luke, when he talks about the early church and what happened at Pentecost, when people ask what, have to, what they have to do, he'll say, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. The key people in the Acts of the Apostles are filled uh, with the Spirit. So really, it's the Spirit is, and we'll see this in the Gospel of St. John, is more clearly presented as the presence of Jesus. So to say yes to Jesus and no to the church is really um, almost a contradiction in terms because the church is the presence of Jesus in that period uh, when he has left us in terms of his physical presence. We need the church. We are all baptized in the church. And what happens at baptism, we receive the spirit. With confirmation, the spirit takes us further into the mystery of Jesus. And the Eucharist, which at the very heart of our faith, it is the spirit that is important there. I don't know whether you've often noticed, but just prior to the words of consecration, we ask the spirit to make Jesus present. And then immediately after the consecration, we actually ask the, the spirit to make us one um, as a community in Jesus. So the very life of our faith is linked with the church. So while we could go on and talk more about that, I think it's important that we recognize the church. I don't wish to suggest that the church is absolutely perfect. The church is the presence of Jesus within a human community. And it doesn't mean that everybody is perfect because the spirit is here. But it does say that within that human body, that is a divine body, we do have the presence of the spirit and we do have um, the presence of Jesus. One thing I also wanted to bring from um, uh, Luke is the idea of resisting the spirit. He accuses um, on one occasion uh, a group of resisting the spirit and it reminds us that because the spirit is with us it doesn't mean that we are always open to the spirit. 
And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the spirit in the life of the individual believer. Let's move on to, to, the, to St. John, the Gospel of St. John. And what we find there is that John speaks a lot about the spirit that is to come when Jesus uh, leaves. Uh, he refers to it as the paraclete, uh, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. But he, he dwells on the fact that he has to go and that when he goes, the Holy Spirit will come from him and from the Father. Clearly, we've got the beginning of a Trinitarian emphasis here that Jesus, the Father and the Spirit all share in the one um, mission and the one nature. I think that's brought out when the Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. The author of the Gospel of John uses words in a way that you won't find in the dictionary. And he wants to present through these words that the life of God has come to us in Jesus and that we are to live that life and share it with others. So the spirit is the spirit of truth. The Joe and I writing to talk about God as the truthful one. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. In other words, the truthfulness, the very nature of God is present to us um, in Jesus. And the spirit of truth is also part of that life. And we are to walk in the truth. In other words, what is being offered to us is a share in that, that divine life. So John's making it very clear that um, what is going to take place when Jesus leaves is that the presence uh, will carry on. Uh, Matthew doesn't talk about the um, Pentecost, but he does say, after saying that they are to make disciples of all nations, he says, and behold, I will be with you all days, even to the end of the world. No mention of the spirit, but as we'll see in John, that's the role of the spirit to be the presence of Jesus. That the spirit is not meant to be something new. It's not as if the spirit comes to build on what Jesus said and, and give us something different. According to John, the spirit comes in order that it might, uh, or that the, spirit, the person of the spirit might help us to appreciate what actually happened um, with Jesus. Um, John says that the spirit will glorify Jesus. And what that means is that um, it, it, the spirit will, will continue to tell what Jesus did and also help us to appreciate the depths of what um, Jesus did. I think in all of the disciples, all of the gospels, it's clear the disciples didn't really understand until after the resurrection. And so they needed the spirit to help them to appreciate the mystery that had taken place um, in Jesus. But let's look at for a moment at how the, um, uh, the author of the gospel talks about the sending of the spirit. Uh, we're celebrating Pentecost, which is 50 days after Easter. But in the gospel of John, it all happens on one day. Jesus rises in the morning. He speaks to Mary Magdalene and says, careful, I haven't yet ascended to my father. And then in the evening, he appears uh, to the disciples. And it is there that the Pentecost event actually takes place. He enters and he says, as the father has sent me, I send you. So immediately the context is that they are to carry on uh, the ministry that Jesus had begun. And having said that, Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. The action of breathing is quite significant. In Genesis, God breathed life into Adam. And there's wonder, that wonderful story in Ezekiel, the valley of the bones, that all the bones are there. And the prophet is told to breathe on them and gradually the bones um, come to life. And if Jesus is breathing on the disciples, uh, I think it's true to say that this is a new creation. It's something new that is going to take place. 
And Jesus continues, receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. I think most of us think about the sacrament of um, reconciliation when we hear that. But really what Jesus is doing is giving the disciples power over sin. It always amazes me that the salvation that is presented in the Gospels is salvation from sin. At the words of consecration over the chalice in the Mass, the words are conclude with for the remission of sins. And the point being made is that really um, what the salvation event is, it's a battle between God and Satan. It's, been, it's a battle between good and the sin. And what's actually taking place in our salvation is that we are being freed from the, the triumph or the rule of sin that had been there in the past in order to enter a new way of life, which is the life of the spirit. So John, I think, is doing what Luke has done, uh, making it clear that this is something that's going to happen when Jesus leaves. But really what, what is happening is that the disciples are empowered and they're empowered to be witnesses, just as um, Luke maintained that the disciples of Pentecost were to be um, empowered. I'd like to move from there to say some words about uh, St. Paul. And I, I think Paul's interesting because I think both um, John and um, Luke are a bit more focused on the church in general, even though um, as Luke unfolds, we see that the individual believer is living the life of the spirit. But I think Paul does it so much, or so much better, or in a good way anyway. Um, St. Paul talks about the fact that we are temples of the spirit, that God actually dwells in you. John's um, paraclete uh, was going to be with the disciples and in the disciples. In other words, what we're talking about here is the indwelling of the spirit. That the spirit is not someone out there who is helping us along like a, uh, an external person, but the spirit is like a leaven that is within us and is working positively to help us live in a new way because uh, of, of what has happened in Jesus. St. Paul talks about the spirit as the first installment, the guarantee that we will be able to live the life um, of the spirit. And the spirit is the seal that God has put on us. So Paul is filled with images about the spirit and acknowledging the fact that the spirit has not come to the church in general, but is actually making present um, the mystery of God in our life. I was thinking of the first letter of St. John, where um, the author there talks about the fact that we know that God lives in us because God has shared with us his spirit. So it's that internal leavening of the spirit that I think is very important. But I want to focus particularly for the moment on that wonderful section in, um, in Paul in Romans chapter eight, verses one to 17. And he makes very clear, and he says quite explicitly, that we have been released from the law of the spirit of life. Uh, I'm sorry, we have been relief, relieved from the law uh, of sin for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That that's what's happening. And the freedom of the sons of God is that we are free from the law of sin and death. And in that text, he, he's contrasting people who walk according to the spirit and people who walk according to the law. And what Jesus has come is to help us to go beyond that. He talks to you about the flesh there. We know that famous uh, statement of St. Paul where he says, um, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, they're the very things that I do. And what he's doing there is acknowledging that tension, 
that we all find in our life. It is our teaching that uh, our nature, our human nature, which was meant to take us naturally to God, has been disoriented by sin. Its default was meant to be God, but in fact, its default has become our own selfish uh, tendencies. And St. Paul contrasts the life of the flesh and the life of the spirit. Um, you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. And why? Because the spirit of God dwells in you. Sometimes people say, I wish I could feel the spirit or see the spirit. In fact, uh, the disciples wanted to see the father. But the point being made is that we do experience the spirit. That as we work on that conflict um, to be given to the disorientation of our nature or to respond to the spirit, it is the spirit that helps us to do that. And when we do resist tendencies that could lead us into something contrary to our Christian life, then that is the spirit that is actually working in us. And I think it's important to recognize that, um, that that is actually going on. And that's an important part of our journey to God. I think we all would say, well, we know that we have to pray in order to come close to God. Uh, but St. Teresa of Avila says on one occasion that if you go to God solely in terms of contemplation, you'll end up a spiritual dwarf. In other words, prayer is not enough. There are two steps that are needed, prayer and the working to transform this story, this, this disoriented nature of ours. My own personal opinion is that very often people who are faithful to prayer tend to neglect that work to transform our life. In traditional language, you could say it's overcoming our vices and practicing the virtues. But it needs to be done. I think that um, when people begin to lapse from the commitment they have in the faith, then what really happens is, I think that's the part that goes. They'll still say prayers, but they won't accept the challenge of actually overcoming those selfish tendencies in order that they might um, come closer to the Lord. So we do experience the spirit as often as we choose um, God over ourselves, then it is the spirit that enables us to do it. And that spirit will bring us to be like Jesus. In that text that I, I mentioned, uh, St. Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he says he has, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So we are temples of the spirit. And it means that we really need to have a, um, to make an effort to make uh, a worthy dwelling place for the spirit. I think it's true to say that maturity in our Catholic faith, our Christian faith, is really something that is internal. To be holier is not to do more things. It's to do the things we always do, but to do them with greater love. And it's the transformation of our heart that enables that to happen. St. Paul talks about the gifts of the spirit, or rather the fruits of the spirit. And what he's saying there is that if we are loyal to um, the efforts that we're, we're making, that we will have those fruits of the Spirit in our life. And he enumerates them, that they are love, joy, peace, uh, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we want to know, uh, is the Spirit bearing fruit in our life? We need to ask, are we loving? Are we joyful? Are we peaceful? Are we patient? Are we good? Are we kind? Are we faithful, gentle? And do we have self-control? 
that seems to be almost a, an unusual gift of the spirit or fruit of the spirit. But it's that control that we've spoken about. It's that control in which we actually um, are able consciously always to select what the spirit is calling us to and being able uh, to avoid um, what has really um, led us into a poor situation in the past. So I think St. Paul brings out very clearly the work of the spirit in the life of each one of us. And I believe it's there that we need um, to urge our people to work. I don't think people questioning question that you should pray. Praying is not enough. As St. Teresa said, or end up as a dwarf. You won't have a maturity um, that really that comes from working to transform our nature from its self-centeredness to an other oriented um, person, God, Jesus, spirit, but also to those people in the world. That really the role of the spirit in the church and in the lives of individuals is really a way of reaching out to transform the society and the world in which we live. I often make the point that there are 5 million people who write Catholic on the census, and there are more than 60%, I think the figure is, who put themselves down as Christian. But are they mature people who are transforming our society? I think sometimes society is having more effect on us than we are having on society. And the challenge I think of today is not just to be doing great external things, but calling people that deeper faith. And it's through that deeper faith that the spirit is able to work. That really God has chosen to do things through us. I'm sure we could all come up with a better way of doing it, but that's the way that God has chosen. And when we do things, when we respond to the spirit, what's taking place there is really not just something that's due to our talents and our gifts that we have, but it's the spirit of God. It is Jesus working through us to others. And very often you can find people who are the least talented in terms of the world, but they are the most powerful in sharing the mystery of Jesus with others. We've spoken about the... Um, the gift of the, uh, the gifts, the fruits of the spirit. But I'd like to talk now about the gifts of the spirit. And that's important as well. Um, the gifts of the spirit are things that we see, we actually uh, receive in baptism. And I liken the, the gifts of the spirit to those parts of our, um, our body, um, which keep us going, but we don't <laughs> our nervous system, the various digestive things that take place in our body. We're not conscious of those. We know they exist because the doctors tell us. But in fact, they're things that are keeping us healthy, even without us being conscious of them. And I, I think that the works of the spirit, um, the gifts of the spirit, are that. That they're things that are happening in our life. And what happens as we grow and respond more to the spirit, those gifts take us to a new level of engagement um, with the Lord. So I'd like just to briefly go through, them. not very long, but the first of them um, is wisdom. And each of the, um, of the gifts tends to relate uh, to a virtue. And really what the gifts do, they go further than a virtue can go. In a sense, when we work with the virtues, we're using natural reason, as it were. But when the gifts of the spirit are active, then something more is happening. We are being taken to a deeper level, not because something we're doing, but because of something that the Holy Spirit is doing. So the gift of wisdom makes us more receptive to the divine motion that moves us to savour the things of God. Um, it tends to help us to judge all things in our relationship to God. Uh, in the Old Testament, um, it's clear that God created through wisdom. And 
and the New Testament sees wisdom as the model of Jesus. But to have wisdom is really to be attuned to God. And as one grows in faith, it's the, it's the gift of wisdom that helps us to become more attuned um, uh, to, the, to the spirit and to God. So wisdom is the first one. Another one is understanding. And understanding helps us to have a deeper insight into the truths of our faith. In other words, we can study the truths of our faith and we can come to deeper rational insights. But what we're talking about with the gift of understanding is coming to a deeper appreciation of our faith. Over the years, I've been associated with the, um, the cause of the servant of God, Eileen O'Connor, uh, a lay woman, an invalid, who started a movement to help the poorest of the poor. And eventually, those that came after her uh, became a religious order. And she now is being looked at in terms of going on to God. Uh, but because of her, she was an invalid, she had practically no education at all. She wasn't able to attend school in the normal way. And I've looked into her life very closely and looked at all the things in Rome. And there's not really any evidence that she did any theology. And she doesn't write much. But what she does write shows a great sensitivity to the truths of our faith. And it highlights the fact that sometimes people can come to a greater appreciation of our faith without actually going through the academic way of having to learn all about it. And that's what the spirit of understanding um, does. It, it helps us to come to a deeper appreciation of the things in the creed, for example. Those things in our faith that now uh, we come to an appreciation that really is part of our um, experience of God. Another one is counsel. And, uh, well, perhaps I should say the understanding relates to the virtue of faith. The things we believe, the gift of understanding gives us that deeper insight that we couldn't have uh, unless we had the gift of the spirit. Um, the gift of counsel or right judgment linked to the virtue of prudence. And it helps us to perform actions, to actually make choices that um, will bring us closer to God. So uh, sometimes this becomes almost an instinct of things. We might go through a long process of discernment to find out how, how to go forward. But I think the gift of the spirit, the gift of counsel, makes that almost uh, something that one does uh, by nature, as it were. So again, the gift of the spirit, a way to come to an action that really is the work of the spirit rather than our own work. Another gift is the gift of knowledge. And um, the gift of knowledge uh, helps us to appreciate the, um, the things that relate to God. In other words, that if we look around, we live in, a, in the context of the divine milieu. Um, Saint Andrew of Foligno says that the world is full of God. And one of the spiritual writers that I like very much says that, that we need to learn to look with the eyes of faith. He makes the point that, that God is like a son of darkness and the rays that come from a son of darkness are dark and our eyes are not made to accept them. Therefore, we've got to look with the eyes of faith. And if we look with the eyes of faith, many of the things that we see with our human eyes actually have a deeper meaning. Du Cossard, the author that I'm talking about, talks about the sacrament of the present moment. That in every moment, God is there coming to us and we can respond to God. We can draw from the presence of God the strength that we need to act appropriately as a disciple of Jesus in that particular um, event. So what the gift of knowledge is doing is helping us to see God in the things around us and therefore to respond to God with those things um, as well. 
Another um, gift is the gift of fortitude, which links uh, with the idea of courage. That there are times when heroism is needed. We look around the world and we see that people are losing their lives because they are disciples of Jesus. Now, obviously, we all hope that we might have the strength to do that. But the gift of the Spirit gives us that heroism that we need, something that can be um, very difficult uh, indeed. The next one is uh, piety or reverence, the gift of the Spirit, and it does two things. It um, deepens our appreciation of our relationships with God. It relates to the, to the virtue of justice. Uh, within it, the virtue of religion is that virtue whereby we give to God that respect that God really deserves to have. And uh, as a result of that, that overflows into giving to others, and particularly to our spiritual family, um, the respect that they deserve um, as well. And the last of the, um, um, of the gift of the Spirit is one that is often not really understood, and that is the fear of the Lord. Um, I think we have difficulty in taking that on board at times. I know that in our um, ceremony of confirmation for a long time, um, we spoke about not the fear of the Lord, but awe and wonder before God. And there is a sense of awe and wonder before God that is essential to fear of the Lord. But we can have awe and wonder as we look at a wonderful sunset or when we look at some great painting. Just awe and wonder is not enough. The really fear of the Lord is acknowledging that, but then wanting to be part of that reality, wanting to identify with that goodness that is seen there and not wanting to engage in any way that might separate us from what we have seen in awe and wonder. And the fear is the fear that we might step away from that uh, wonderful thing uh, that has been experienced. So it's being overwhelmed by the greatness of God. And awe and wonder can be part of it, but I, I think that it doesn't really capture the fact because of the effect that it has on us. Now, I notice that we're, we're almost finished, and I'd just like to um, do one more thing. A number of years ago, myself and a friend jotted down 10 statements about the Holy Spirit. And I'd just like to read them. I think they sum up what we have been doing, and I think we have a few minutes uh, where we have time to do it. The first statement is, the Holy Spirit comes forth from the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is divine, shares the life of the Father and the Son. Through the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son express the love of the Trinity for the world. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is the divine personal presence which makes available to us the saving mystery of the risen Lord. The Holy Spirit makes this saving mystery available in the church. The role of the Holy Spirit is not to add to the saving mystery, but to continue the work of Jesus. The third statement, from the beginning, the Holy Spirit has guided salvation history. The Holy Spirit teaches us through the written account that is salvation history, the scriptures. We can learn about the Holy Spirit reading and discerning. We meet God, we meet Jesus clearly uh, in the Eucharist, but we also believe we meet Jesus through the Spirit in reading the Scriptures. The fourth statement, the Holy Spirit interacts with humankind to make the Word more fully known to us. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live the Word by enabling us to live the Word the Spirit transforms us to be disciples of Jesus. Number five, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to continue his mission. The Spirit carries on the mission of Jesus by inspiring the disciples of Jesus. From the first Pentecost, 
to the contemporary situation today. Number six, the Holy Spirit draws believers into the divine life. We deepen our involvement in divine life by the life that we live. The Spirit is the first fruits and guarantee of our sharing that life in eternity. Number seven, the Holy Spirit offers to all people special gifts and fruits. The Spirit provides different charisms to enrich the life of the community. These charisms are gifts which the believer develops by using them. This development is the believer's response to the Spirit. The eighth one, the Holy Spirit can only work effectively in us if our hearts are open to the Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit is to bring people to Jesus. The freedom of the sons of God is the freedom we have to respond to the Spirit. I think that being open to the Spirit is something that very often uh, we fail in, that we resist the Spirit in the light of what we want to do ourselves. Number nine, the Holy Spirit is the principle of unity within the church. The first fruit of the Spirit is love, which is the sign of the follower of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is particularly at work in the liturgical life of the church, as we saw earlier in the sacraments and the Eucharist. And the last links the spirit with Christian hope. Christian hope invol involves the application of our faith to our present situation. Christian hope helps us to carry our cross daily. As a temple of the spirit, the believer is the living beacon of Christian hope to the world. I think those 10 statements may not cover everything, but they at least sum up the things that I've tried to mention um, in this talk. Now, I think our time is up. Um, so I pass back to the host who can organize any questions that you might have. By the normal, yeah, the, the, the things, by, by just doing the things that uh, we need to do and growing through them. And it seems to me that um, to come to the place where the gifts of the council become operative, uh, it's, it's doing those normal things. And the virtue of discernment is one of them, right? And I think it's mm -hmm. right for us to go through a process of discernment, but it can happen. And I, I think it happened in the lady that I mentioned, Arlene O'Connor, that mm. uh, things that she did and, and things that she saw, I think it came through the Holy Spirit rather than the normal avenues, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bishop Dan. Okay. Any more questions, anyone? Um, I'm, I might go next. Yes, uh, Madam Dan. Uh, thank you. Bishop David for that wonderful talk and for all the richness in it. I guess we in our little group focused exactly on that same issue of discernment. And I noticed you talked about rationality and discernment. And I guess we were thinking in terms of how do you know when your discernment is the right one when you really are listening to the spirit or how do you, how do you know when it's your own rationality which may not be um, you know, real. And, you know, what is the difference between discernment and prayer? Well, I, I think that's something we all have to face up to, that um, um, we can go through process of discernment, but there's no, nobody ever guarantee that what would be at the end of the process would be the absolute right thing to do. What it does do is show that we are uh, doing our best to um, actually know what to do. And I think that's a very positive aspect of it at all. But I, I, I think that um, I, I feel that the more we grow in our faith, the more easily those things come to us. And I, I think in, in questions of discernment, um, really it's very central in our life. The story is told in the fourth century about Abbot Anthony, the monk. He was the first of the monks. And if he said something, then uh, that was the end. And on one occasion, they were having a big meeting there. And they were asked, what was the main thing 
uh, in the journey to God. And people talked about fasting and prayer and all those things. And Bishop and Anthony stood up and said it was discretion, which is another word for discernment. And I, I think it's that weighing up of the, of the, the tension between our self-centeredness and the, the pull of the spirit in the other way. And I think it's never, or well, I won't say never, but we have to do that in faith, that in faith we don't always see as clearly as we would like to see. But I think the fact that we proceed in that way um, is helping us and is helping us to grow and also accepting, helping us um, to work through if the thing that we decide to do doesn't work out as being the um, thing that we now recognize didn't lead us to God as we thought. So I, I think all we can do is do our best, that we, um, there is a, a rational sense in, in practicing the virtues of weighing things up. And the point I made about counsel is that that gives way to the work of the spirit. But most of us, I think, have to work at the virtue. So I, I don't think there's any guarantee that um, what you do will be the right thing, as it were. But what I think it does guarantee is that you're acting in a positive way in relationship to the Lord. And you're growing in your relationship to the Lord. And that helps you, I think, if perhaps a decision you may may um, doesn't turn out to be what you thought was the right uh, decision to make. Does that help? Yes, so uh, a starting point, yes, it's something, I guess, to work on and grow in understanding of, yeah, yes, thank yes. you. Yeah. But it, it highlights, you're highlighting the point that um, that's at the very heart of our journey to God. Um, uh, I remember reading somebody who said that um, we choose to be the disciples of Jesus that we want to be. In other words, it's the choices that we make that either bring us close to Jesus or keep us from coming close to Jesus. And it's that choice making um, that is the thing. St. Gregory of Nyssa, one of the fathers of the church, says in the spiritual life, we are our own parents. In other words, we make the choices uh, out of which we are born. And I think you're focusing on that very important area uh, with your question. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that um, interesting line. Yes, <laughs> the other parents <laughs> of our own spiritual life are interesting. Thank you. Any more last questions before we close? Yes, Masadita. Any more questions until? Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably not a question, but a comment. Uh, Bishop, thank you very much for discussing, right. especially the seven gifts. They it really made it clear to me as an individual and I think it's the quest after listening to you it's the quest for maturity in 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 faith you know being ever uh, discerning in whatever we do to enrich our understanding our knowledge and all the other um yeah the virtues so I think uh like like uh, Bernadette it's the discernment that I focus on listening to you and, and the tension always that it's self-centered versus others centered. And we can only achieve that through discernment. Yes. And then accepting that you will not always get it right. So you go back to discernment and that will help you with the maturity that we are seeking. And I, I like to emphasize maturity. I feel honestly that the church hasn't helped lay faithful to come to maturity. That really one of the important things I think in coming to maturity is reading the scriptures. And yet um, we have really kept the Bible from our people. That if you go to a Catholic school, I don't think there's anything, or at least when I was the bishop there, there wasn't anything done that actually prompted the students to read the scriptures. Now, certainly they were told about it, but taking the scriptures and reading the scriptures as part of one's own personal journey, I don't think, well, I think we've kept the, the, 
our lay faithful from that. I'm on a, an executive committee of a body called the Catholic Biblical Federation, which is a Roman committee, Cardinal Taglay. I noticed that there's somebody here with a similar surname. He's our chairperson. But as I go to the meetings there, and I'm on the committee that's running these 340 centers throughout the world, I find that more is being done in Asia, in South America, and in Africa to help people make the scriptures uh, an important part of their life than is being done in the Western world. And I think that's a shame. And really, um, looking back over my ministry and my experience as a as a, as a Catholic, the Bible hasn't been something that's been made available to us or that we've been encouraged to take up on a consistent basis as a way of meeting the law. And yet it's as sure uh, a way of meeting Jesus as the Eucharist or any of the sacraments. Mm. Agree 100%, Bishop. Thank you. Lydia, did you raise your hand? Oh, yeah, unmute if Lydia, if you want to say. Lydia, Lydia, unmute. We can't hear you. I think you might have her sound turned off. No, Linda. Unmute Linda. She's trying Lydia. to unmute. She's trying to unmute. No. Linda, unmute. Yes, yeah, she is on mute. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Click on the microphone, Lydia, if you hover your, your um hover your um mouse the microphone and then click on the microphone button media you can find it in the bottom left at the bottom left if you try to press the bottom left like a microphone it's a red one it's a red microphone okay i think can you um, hear me now oh my goodness yes, yes. yes we can hear you now, yes. Yes. now. Okay. Well, sorry that was the last <laughs> video there is a white uh, what do you call this? There is a white yeah. thing covering it, so I was trying to get it uh, out. <laughs> okay. No, we can hear you. Bishop. Okay, fire your Bishop. question. Okay, Bishop, uh, you know how you said um, you mentioned uh, in your talk very profound. First of all, we are very blessed to have this reflection. Uh, we learn more about the workings of the Holy Spirit in our life. Um, and one time you mentioned about no matter how much you pray or do everything, uh, I was thinking is the purity, how, what's the importance of the purity of intention? Well, I, I, I think intention is very important. And I, I think it's intention that gives meaning to action. You're gonna have two people doing exactly the same action, but it means something different. Uh, because of the intention of the people that are doing it. Um, it might not be a good example, but people can make love out of just um, self-interest and other people can make love as a commitment, uh, as a way of life. Now, it might look the same, but in fact, it's the intention that people have in mind that is the thing. And I, I feel that um, we should always... Um, be conscious of that. St. Paul says in one of, the, one of his letters, um, uh, do always, do it all for the glory of God. That's, that's an intention. That whatever we're doing, we do it for the glory of God. And I, I think that, um, that taking up Bernadette's point about discernment, um, that if we have that intention, that really what we're wanting to do is to discern the best way, then that's a very positive 
action, even if it doesn't turn out to be in the long run, um, the thing that you thought it was going to be. So intention, I think is very important. Remember the old morning offering? Yes. Offer to God, whatever we do. And, and I think there's a, a practice called the practice of the presence of God throughout the day. And it's just consciously remembering through the day that what you're doing, that you do it for the glory of God. You don't have to do different things, but whatever you're doing, do it for the glory of God. And that builds up uh, a relationship so that it, it becomes natural for you uh, to have that intention in a conscious way. Yes. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop. So we... Yes, Joan. I'm sorry. Sorry, Bishop and David. It, uh, there was, sorry, just quickly, few, a couple of people in our group were wondering the, the 10 statements that you said that you and your other colleagues yeah. had together. Is there any way for us to see that in a written form or is that... Oh, yes. Uh, well, I, I have it in a written form. I'm never good at knowing how to give it to you, but if if I could give it to uh, Anita Not or... Not to me, personally. I, I, yeah, wouldn't, yeah. Uh, I don't mind. Um, another way of... Um, doing it might be if I give you my email um, address, then you just send me an email saying you want it and I'll send it back. Oh, okay. and, and my email is fairly easy because it's my name. My name okay. is David Lewis Walker. So it's dl hyphen walker at bigpond.com. dl hyphen, not underscore hyphen, mm -hmm. dl hyphen at bigpond.com. So if you would like it, um, uh, uh, I'm happy for you to do that. But if, if there is a better way of doing it, I'm happy to cooperate with that. Yes. I think if you can send it to us, to me too, um, Bishop, yes. and then anyone who would want it, I can Thanks. share it good. with them. Oh, good. That, that, that's a better way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll send yes. it to you and, and the rest yeah. can get Just from bring it out, Anita. And I, yes. I'm not, not very good at... Um, how to do things, but never the best. So uh, maybe, okay. yes, send it I, to I, Nanita Bishop Walker, mm, and then she yeah. can share it she with can, us. She can, yeah, yes. that'd, be, that'd be better. That'd be, yeah. Yeah. If we yeah. don't want to person. inundate you, that we should yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, You I'm might receive 100 I'm emails, Bishop. So, um, <laughs> okay. I'll yeah. endeavor that. I, I, I can't always do these Bishop things, but I'll endeavor to do that as soon as we're Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop. We promise we won't inundate you. Thank you, Bishop. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, Bishop, um, shall we close off with a yeah. prayer? Oh, yes. I was going to pray again the, the prayer that we began with because I think it's a, yeah. a well-known prayer and captures what we've been talking about. So let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, Spirit. fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send, Send forth your, your spirit, spirit, they shall be created, created, and you shall renew, renew the face of the earth. Of the earth. Thank you all, and thank for, thank you for yeah. coming along. To thank, you, thank, thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop Walker. Good night, you, and have a good night, everyone, everyone, for coming. And thank 